Okay, one second. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Welcome to uh, the latest of our Harif lockdown lectures. Uh, this evening, um, we are going to Iraq um, to have a presentation about uh, two Jewish singers um, who were actually very famous in the 19th uh, in the 20th century. Um, uh, but first of all, let me just um, tell you a few basic things, and that is uh, to keep up to date with Harif's uh, activities. Please do subscribe to uh, our mailing list at harif.org if you haven't already, and do check out our sister uh, blog, Point of No Return blog which keeps you updated uh, with the news. Um, this session is being live streamed to the Facebook page. Um, we will, and we uh, will also have a YouTube recording of it uploaded to uh, the Harif website in due course. Um, if you want to ask a question, please do type it into uh, the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. We're absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Sara Manasse, who is an ethnomusicologist. She's also a performer of the music traditions of the Jews of Iraq. And she founded the vocal and instrumental ensemble Rivers of Babylon in London in 1999. And she performs, or they perform, a Judeo-Arabic repertoire of religious and secular songs of the Jews of Iraq, Iraqi songs in Arabic, Middle Eastern instrumental, instrumentals, and vintage Bollywood songs in Hindi. Sara was born in Bombay and moved to London in 1966. She has a master's. She's been a teacher in, uh, in schools and universities. She also has a doctorate. Her doctoral dissertation uh, was about the Iraqi Jewish experience uh, of women in music performance. Sorry, women in music performance, the Iraqi Jewish experience. And she's currently researching uh, Baghdadi and B'nai Israel Jewish musical traditions. She has published books and also CDs. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to you, Sarah, uh, for Jewish uh, Divas in Iraq. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you to Harif, to Lynn and Lawrence Julius for inviting me to present this lecture and for all the many exciting presentations that you've organized um, during this lockdown. So the title as you see it, Jewish Divas in Iraq, and for that too I will thank Lynn um, for suggesting that title, because the rest of it was mine, but uh, uh, Lynn did suggest Jewish Divas in Iraq. So that's um, Salima Pasha Murad, who is the Doyen of Iraqi song, Mas'uda El Bambayli, who was a Dakaka, which is a drummer and singer. So we look at them and also their legacy. Now Salima Pasha, who was later known as Salima Murad, and Mas'ud El Bambayli were both iconic musical figures, two professional Jewish women musicians in a musical world dominated by men. They both performed in the first half of the 20th century, overlapping during approximately the 1930s, and both in Baghdad, but inhabiting very different musical and social spheres. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank Sorry, you. can you increase the volume of, on your computer a little bit? Is it a maximum? I think it probably is, and um, I can speak a bit louder, if yes, you like. Yes, that would be lovely. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, let me know. So Salima Pasha Murad, um, 1907 to 1974, she was the doyen of female singers in the public domain in all of Iraq, not just in Baghdad, and in the whole of the 20th century. Salima, a 
originally achieved fame as Selima Pasha, pronounced that way, Pasha, which was her family surname. During the 1930s, the Prime Minister of Iraq, Nuri Said, was given the honorific title of Pasha, pronounced Pasha, and the government insisted that Salima should change her surname so as not to be confused with that of the Prime Minister, who was known as El Pasha. She consequently changed her surname to Murad, which was her father's first name. And I want to thank now the late Yeheskel Kojaman, the author and musicologist for these details, and for sharing with me over about 30 years his first-hand knowledge of music and musicians in Baghdad. I'm sure you will see his name um, quite often through this presentation. Now, Salima's high status is not in doubt. Uh, we could look at the next slide, please. Yeah. Sorry, Sarah, there was a slight problem with the sound. It, um, someone says it's worse now. Oh, it's <laughs> the sound worse. keeps coming and going. So perhaps stand a little bit further away from the, sit a little bit further away. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's okay. It's is okay. that any better? Is that okay? No, 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 so writing about women singers, Yehaskel Kodaman writes, at the time, it was considered shameful for a woman to sing in public so that no respectable family would allow their daughter to become a professional singer. Thus, a situation existed whereby women singers and dancers were recruited from local brothels from among those who had musical talent. Despite this, Salima Murad was loved and respected. She was asked to sing at numerous private parties where she earned a high fee. Now, Salima was invited to perform for the Prime Minister, Nuri Said. She performed for the rich, at nightclubs, on radio programs, and her songs were composed exclusively for her by leading composer musicians of the day. In stark contrast, on the next slide, Masouda El Bambayli, or Masouda the Bombayite, was a dakaka, a floralist dakakat. And this was a profession associated primarily with music in the home, music in the private domestic sphere. The dakaka initially performed exclusively for women, and her profession was a hereditary one, generally. A women's tradition associated mainly with the pre wedding. Henna evening, the Layl Dul Henni. Dakakat performed mainly in Baghdad, also in Basra, since at least the 18th century, and apparently the profession was sanctioned by the rabbinate, possibly because the Dakaka herself initially performed only for women, and she was herself a mature woman past childbearing age. She sang, accompanying herself on the nakara, which you see here, the small pair of tunable drums, which she hit with two sticks. And um, the name of her profession relates to the hitting or beating, which is dak in Arabic, of the drums. Um, and in the next slide, we see that the dakaka was the leader of the group with a small chorus of two, three, or more women. And they were known as the Radada or the Radadat, the ones who responded. We don't know exactly who is in this photograph. It could be Masoud al-Bambayli with her group. I'm not really sure. Um, so the rest of her group sang the refrains and played a large tambourine, the duff. Now their unique repertoire was for the Jalwa or Khalwa ceremony, which is the same thing. Jalwa was sight or showing of the henna and Chabwa is dyeing the fingers with henna. So that's when they performed, when the henna was applied to the bride-to-be's fingers. From the 20th century, it became customary for the groom-to-be and his family to take part. The Dakaka sang a standard repertoire of songs associated with this occasion, mostly in the Judeo-Arabic dialect of Baghdad. 
and she often improvised the text of the verses to suit the occasion and praise those who were present with the hope that those who were honored would respond by throwing money to the group to augment their very modest earning from the host. The entire Hannah repertoire is characterized by a single rhythmic mode, which I was told is Ugrug. Nowadays, a lot of people call it Jurigina, and we see it in the next slide. So, for those who read music, it doesn't matter if you don't, Ugrug or Jurigina is a 10 beat rhythm, and it goes doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck. We will hear quite a lot of that shortly. The Ugrug rhythm is quintessentially Iraqi and not generally known in other Arab countries. In fact, from my own experience during fieldwork in Israel in the 1990s, even the most accomplished Egyptian musicians would leave the stage as soon as the Iraqi musicians started to play songs in this rhythm. So you've heard it, boom, tuck, tuck, boom, tuck. And in the next slide, we'll see one of the songs that's performed by the Dakata. Um, so it's Rannu al al sing to the fair one, Yala Bisirwardi, who's dressed in pink. Well, ma yiranula, if no one will sing for her, Ranait ana wahdi, then I'll sing alone. It goes, Rannu al al Yala Yalla Bisirwardi, well, ma yiranula, Ranait ana wahdi. And in the next slide, we'll see the Ugrug rhythm as played by the, as, as taught to herself, you could say, by the Dakaka. She didn't need music notation. She didn't go to music school. She had a mnemonic, which was The drum is beating, the scorpions in the hole. That's a pretty good way to remember how the rhythm goes. And when she played it, it was actually a little bit more complicated, as you see in the next slide. Um, so instead of just going, she would go, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, 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 doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, 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 doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, 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 doom. If you keep that in your mind, you'll hear it on, on a recording soon. Okay, so we move on to the next slide, which is an illustration of Masoud al Bombay Lee's family in Bombay. I have to say for years, I tried to find out whose family she was from, where she was in Bombay, something about her, and, and I couldn't. And finally, totally by chance, while interviewing um, Simon Menashe, who very kindly has provided this photograph, about his father, who was a wonderful teacher and singer of uh, Hebrew and Arabic song in Bombay. Simon casually mentioned, he said, and Masoud al-Bambali is my aunt. I said, my goodness, blow me down with a feather. <laughs> Couldn't believe that. Yes, he said Masoud al-Bambali was um, his father's sister. So here we see uh, his, uh, her, her mother, Mijbura, standing, and two of Masoud's uh, brothers, Yusuf is standing, and uh, Saleh Abul Kapra is sitting and his wife Gurji is next to him. Uh, so sorry, no picture of Masouda that I know of, but that's her family. Okay, so though her own mother was not a Dakhaka, it is interesting that Masouda's niece Gurji, who was the daughter of Masouda's sister Tafaha, just so that you get into the family, um, Gurji also performed as a Dakhaka in Bombay during the 30s to the mid 50s. Um, and then later emigrated to Israel. Other Dakhwakat in Baghdad were Farha Bit Shamma, if you remember now the name Farha Bit Shamma, because I will come to her later, and her granddaughter Lulu Shamma, who later emigrated to Israel. Now we have at least two recordings of Mas'ud al Bambayli, which is fantastic, from the 1930s, and we'll see that on the next slide. Um, so the song we're going to hear is called Yadar, O House, O House, Ya Maslaha Kubira, what a grand occasion. We rolled out our carpets for the gathering of the family, and then she praises the bride. Um, so you're going to hear Masoda singing, you're going to hear her 
chorus uh, responding and you're going to hear the loud drumming. And as customary at the time, the recordings start with introducing the performer or performers. And here you'll hear de gagat. De gagat is de gagat. De gagat in the Muslim um, pronunciation. Okay, so maybe we could just hear that now. Thanks. Um, I don't hear anything. There seems to be a problem. Are you hearing anything? That's a shame because it worked perfectly when we tried it. <laughs> um. Could you hear it then? No, I, I didn't, not me. You couldn't hear it at all. Let's try again. Okay. I mean, we heard it, but maybe not very loud. We heard the ululation from the uh, Radadat. Um, okay. Maybe, louder. Yeah. I, I think we can move on. It's okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so um, we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you for being DJ as well, Lawrence. Thank you. <laughs> um, so while the beauty of the bride to be is naturally a central subject, a number of the Kaka songs are also humorous, like this one. And the highlight of the henna evening is Afaki which means bravo, but it doesn't really mean bravo. It's an acerbic text sung as though by one mother, the groom's mother, to the other, her rival, the bride's mother. So we have afaki afaki, oh bravo to you. Ala fandul amaltenu, on the trick that you've played. Wana ta'abtu wana shqaytu, I've tired myself and labored. You've taken him, ready-made. Now, there are many, many verses to this song. Um, we'll just hear a bit of um, the chorus. And over the years, many verses have changed, but with recording, many have become also standardized. Unfortunately, we don't seem to have one of Mas'uda singing it or of a Dakaka recording from Baghdad, but Mas'uda's nephew, Yaqub Ulimari, who was a famous naib or flute player in Baghdad, recorded the song when he emigrated to Israel. And he, as Mas'uda was his aunt, he really recorded it in the style of a dakaka. So it's in the Ibra rhythm and the same um, melodic mode of bayat. Um, now, unlike the dakaka who only had her radada to do the responses and the bit of drumming and a bit of uh, tambourine, um, 
here, Yaakov Elemari is accompanied by the full orchestra of Kol Yisrael, the Shidurei Yisrael Be'Aravit, Israel's broadcasting uh, group in Arabic, of Arabic music. And another thing that's really important is that Yaakov Elemari had played in the broadcasting orchestra of Baghdad Radio from 1936. So he was a brilliant musician and composer as well and singer. So, um, yep, we could hear this one and hopefully it will sound good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you to the DJ. That was very good, Lawrence. Thank you. Um, yes, you can see how the bride's uh, mother has been so um, terrible. She goes to the um, to Abu Yusuf and she keeps him up on summer nights like tonight and and she fans him with a fan. Anyway, there are, however, a number of recordings of Afaki made in Baghdad by famous Muslim and Jewish male singers or reciters or vocalists of Iraqi maqam. Emil just mentioned that Yaqub al-Imari was also a maqam singer. Now, maqam is a time-honored art music tradition where the vocalist is known as the Qari maqam, reciter of maqam. Um, Iraqi maqam has been performed in public by the most highly respected and highly regarded maqam performers in Baghdad for hundreds of years and has been recorded since at least the 1930s by Jewish and Muslim performers. Until the 1950s, the Chalri musicians, that's the instrumentalists who often um, accompanied maqam, were all Jewish. But most Qari maqam were Muslim, some were Jewish as well. So in the next slide, we see Sorry. Sorry, it's okay. In the next slide, we see a most famous uh, maqam singer, Rashid al Qundarchi, Qari Maqam. And his recording of Afaki is known to be a classic. Um, when it's sung as part of, uh, when Afaki is sung as part of a maqam performance, um, it comes right at the end of the maqam. So if you think of a fairly serious symphony or something, and then the final movement or the final little bit would be a metrical, light hearted piece. So Afaki is performed right at the end as a pasta or metrical song. Um, whoever is sung by Muslim or Jewish, it always retains the Baghdad Judeo-Arabic dialect. And in a maqam performance, its character is transformed to a more serious mode. It goes into maqam sabah, which has got another flat, so it makes it more serious. And instead of the tripping Ugrud rhythm that we've been hearing, it goes into Sangin Sama'i, which is a six beat rhythm, rhythm, which we see in the next slide. Um, if you don't read music, not important, it goes doom, tak, tak, doom, tak, doom, tak, tak, doom, tak, etc. So um, here we have in the um, next slide, a highly respected Muslim singer performing the same song, the same words, and it's associated with a modest Jewish women's tradition in the Judeo-Arabic dialect of Baghdad. Uh, Kundarchi is accompanied by the Chalri, the instrumental ensemble of four players, two melodic and two percussion. We have the Joza, which is a spike fiddle, the Santur, which is a hammered dulcimer, the duff, tambourine, and the dumbuk, goblet-shaped drum. And all of these players at the time would have been Jewish. This time the recording is prefaced with Rashid Effendi Kundarchi, Effendi being 
the title of respect. Yes, let's hear that, please. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a very much more stately performance than the Dakaka type of performance. And the singers right at the end would have been the instrumentalists. So typically the Chalhi instrumental musicians sing in all the uh, choruses. Um, we can move on to the next slide, which is just a blank slide. Uh, the Dakaka's own, that's correct. Um, okay, that's fine. Um, the Dakaka's own performance context and repertoire went beyond the henna ceremony. She and her group might continue their evening program for another two to three hours, though rarely after midnight, and they would then sing songs of their choice, Bastat, which are metrical songs, Iraqi folkloric songs, and popular songs of the day, including those of Selim Mamurad. So, for example, on the Dakaka night, the Dakaka group rarely performed after midnight as a license for performing with percussion instruments, which is very loud in their performance, was necessary after midnight. In the case of a Dakaka performance, the host rarely arranged for such a license, which had to be purchased from the mayor. However, for Chalri and Iraqi Maqam performances, which obviously had a higher status, it was customary to arrange for this license. Some Dakakat even did sing from the Iraqi Maqam repertoire. But this aspect of Dakaka entertainment, the Dakaka night, became rarer after the 1930s with competition from entertainment by nightclub artists who would perform after midnight. Dakaka also performed for other life cycle events like um, the Pidyon, Brith Mila, Bar Miswa, things like that. And they also entertained at homes, private homes for Jewish festivals such as Purim when the doors of homes in the Jewish quarter were open and different entertainers, Jewish and Muslim, would come in and perform for a short time for reward. For this too, I'm grateful to Yehaskel Kojaman for the information. Dakakat also sometimes played at Muslim homes for women's parties, for example, at celebrations preceding a wedding or for the birth of a son. Now, they did sometimes perform outside the home. She also appeared as both a participant and performer at the pilgrimage or ziyara or visiting to holy tombs in Iraq, as we see in the next slide. Sorry, could, yeah. the next slide, please. Thank you. So here we see the tomb of Ezekiel, the prophet at Kifl near Hela on the river Euphrates. Uh, it shows the exterior of the tomb above and the interior below. This photograph obviously is from many years ago, and I don't know what the state of the tomb is today. Um, so Yosef ben Ezra Yehuda was leader of the Jewish community in Kifl and overseer of the tomb of Ezekiel the prophet at the beginning of the 20th century. And we have an interesting account of the Dakaka from his daughter, Flora Kiflawi, and that we see in the next slide, please. So she writes, each evening after prayers, there would be performances by musicians with drums and cymbals. The musicians had arrived together with the pilgrims before the festival. Among them was a famous drummer by the name of Mas'uda El Bambalia, 
whose family came from Bombay in India. She appeared every night with a band of three or four Jewish women. They would sit in the courtyard and play with the pilgrims gathering around. Mas'uda would sing for the pilgrims, for the children, or for those who sought a blessing, and the listeners would toss money to her. Despite this very public role, playing in public to men and women, the Dakaka was always regarded as a respectable woman. We'll now move on to Salima's uh, contribution. Thank you. Salima Pasha Murad was a glamorous and successful female performer, clearly a diva. She was known as the Um Kulthum of Iraq and also as the singing nightingale, Al Bulbul al Sadah, for the beautiful full throated singing voice that she had with its characteristic catch. Generally speaking, however, Baghdad in the first half of the 20th century was no place for any decent woman to perform in public. Nevertheless, a number of women singers were acknowledged and respected musical experts, and their esteem is clear from the numerous recordings of them made at the time. We can move on to the next song, uh, next uh, slide. Thank you. Modern song. Salima was the most renowned female singer of modern song. The term modern was coined by Kojaman to describe the song tradition that developed in the two decades following World War I, in distinction to the older style of maqam music. We heard a little bit of the style of maqam singing earlier. Salima also sang Abu Dhiya, which is an unmetered, unmetered genre. In the next slide, you'll see she also performed at the nightclub. She performed every night at the Jawahari nightclub in Baghdad to an exclusively male audience. She was accompanied by resident musicians who accompanied all the dancers and singers. Salima was the star of the evening and appeared for the last half hour when she danced and sang. Next slide, something about her musicians. Her musicians included the Syrian oud player, Saliba al Khatrib who was the only non-Jewish oud player in Baghdad at the time. Also, Abdu Saada, the famous, famous Jewish singer, also from Syria, who played duff, that's the tambourine, and sang as part of the chorus for Salima. Sa Saada was a singer in his own right, and he was known in Iraq as Malak Mawal, that is, the king of Mawal, an expert in the performance style of the Mawal, which is a particular verse form. In the next slide, Abdu Saada, Malak Mawal. Um, this, this photograph I'm especially happy to have received um, from Suzanne Sharbani, who is Abdu Saada's daughter. She's also a professional singer, Iman. So very happy to have this photograph from her. In the early 1950s, Saada and his family emigrated to Israel, where he continued to be in demand as a professional singer. In Iraq, he's still been held in esteem and remarkably on the eve of the Gulf War, that was in 1990, quite a while back, Radio Baghdad gave his recordings pride of place in their broadcasts. So even though he was Jewish, he was still, um, uh, he was still honored. In the next slide, we see a little bit of um, Baghdad Radio. Salima also sang on her weekly program on Baghdad Radio, which began broadcasting in 1936. She was accompanied there by Saleh al Kweti, who was a very prominent and important musician, by Saleh al Kweti and his group, who were the resident musicians. And they were known as the Furqat al the, um, the broadcasting ensemble. And then following that, she would go on to the nightclub to perform. In the next slide, we see the iconic portrait of iconic musicians from 1936. And this is with the inception of Baghdad Radio's broadcasting ensemble and the radio broadcasting itself. Now, standing in the center is the leader, Saleh al Kweti, on violin. Saleh had been asked to form Baghdad Radio's official musical ensemble when it started. And it was this ensemble that would also accompany Salima on her weekly radio program. Um, just to mention a few others, Salah's brother Dawood al Kweti is seated on the left playing an oud. He was a singer, a composer, and an awad oud player. 
And standing behind the oud player on the left is Yaqub al Imari, who we heard earlier, um, the Nai player, the flute player. Um, Saleh is also credited with being the first person to introduce a cello to this ensemble, which you see. And uh, Yusuf Zarur is uh, playing the Hanun in the center and, and playing the percussion, whether Western or Arab percussion, was uh, Hussein Abdallah. So Hussein is Muslim, the rest were Jews, and this was the, um, the official broadcasting ensemble. If we move on to the next slide, we see that um, Salima also was invited to sing at private celebrations, such as parties for the henna ceremony, which was celebrated a night or so before the wedding. Salima didn't normally bring her own musicians from the nightclub, but usually the Kuwaiti brothers and other musicians would come after midnight following the radio broadcast and accompany Salima or Afifa Iskander or other invited singers who would also arrive after midnight. Salima was able to command high fees for such occasions. And in the next slide, we see that Salima also starred and sang in the first Iraqi film, Aliya wa Assam in 1949. And all the music here, songs and instrumentals, were all composed by Saleh al Kuwaiti. Now, Saleh composed really 90% of the songs that Salima sang. This is just very, very few songs, and the first six are all composed by Saleh al Kuwaiti. Galbak Sakhar Jalmud, Your Heart is of Stone, Khadri Al Chai, Brew the Tea, Ala Shawati Dijla, On the Shores of the Tigris, Hada Moon Saf Minnak, It's Not Fair of You, etc. And Yaqub Al Imari is uh, credited with number seven, Ya Al Khalad, and Salim Al Nur, Ayu Al Saqi. We will hear some of these shortly. Um, yep, let's move on to the next slide, please. So in Ala Shawati Dijla, um, the text invokes images of nature and romance on the Tigris River that flows through Baghdad. So very much um, an Iraqi song and bound up with Baghdad. The rhythmic mode here is the six beat Sangin Sama'i, which we talked about earlier, also typically Iraqi. This recording is on the Sodwa label and prefaced with the name of the label, followed by Sit Salima Pasha. Sit being a lady and a title of respect. So we can hear a little bit of this one. Thank you. So that is really very evocative of Baghdad and the Tigris River. And we hear so many uh, accounts of people who remember the Tigris River. Um, and certainly when, when I was in Israel, very often Iman would start her program with this song and everyone would sigh and be happy. Um, now, many of these compositions, both the text and the music, are printed in folkloric collections of Iraqi song, as we see in the next slide. Thank you. So this is um, a folkloric collection of Iraqi songs by Hilmi, and it has um, really an amazing number of songs. Sometimes the name of the singer or composer is mentioned alongside the text, but at that time, it was never the case that a Jewish composer would be mentioned. So 
Salah al Kwaiti is not mentioned, and in this case, neither is Salima Murad, but she often has been mentioned in this collection in different songs. Um, more recently, though, we have to say Jewish composers have been well acknowledged in Iraq. Um, a number of the al Kwaiti compositions, perhaps most, are in the typically Iraqi rhythm that I mentioned earlier of Ugrug, which is also the Dakaka's rhythm, known more as Georgina today. So, for example, in the next slide, um, which is called Khadri al Chai, Brew the Tea, um, we see in Helmi's um, publication both the music and the text. It tells you it tells you what the rhythm is, it tells you what the melodic mode is, it gives the words and the music, but it doesn't mention the composer or the singer. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please, which is also Khadri al Chai um, in transliteration and translation. So Khadri al Chai, Khadri, brew the tea, brew it. Bayuni al Mana Khadra, for my eyes, for whom do I brew it? Shmalit ya ba'adur ruh, why are you What's the matter, precious one? Do mich michidra, you're always sad. And she says, ah lif ma I will swear never will I brew the tea, nor will I sit in front of it. Laman yajil mahbu, until my beloved comes, but hanab jamala, and I will enjoy it with his beauty. So until her beloved comes, she will not brew any tea. So we can listen to that now. Thanks. Um, I should say that some of these recordings are taken with Emil Cohen's permission from his wonderful website, the Elkwaiti event, and I believe this one too. Um, thank you, Emil. Um, now to move on to another composer for, uh, for Salima. So Salima Noor, um, when he was 18 in 1938, Salim Noor presented Salima Pasha with his song composition. The text of the song was the 12th century Muwashah. A Muwashah is a girdle poem, and the name of it is Ayu al Saqi, which Noor had studied at school. He liked the text, he composed the music, and the song clearly appealed to Salima and was recorded in Baghdad. This composition, too, is in the most Iraqi of rhythms, the 10 beat Ugrug as we see in the next slide. So, Ayuha Saqi ilaik al mushtaka. O cupbearer, our complaints are addressed to you. We've called you and you, you don't listen. Um, so let's listen to a little bit of this by Sali, sung by Salima and composed in Baghdad. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, 
Um, and in the next slide, we'll see that uh, Helmi also um, has printed this music and the text, but unfortunately doesn't mention Selim and Noor or, or the singer. Um, now, when Selim and Noor emigrated to Israel, and he is the composer of many Sama'is, uh, instrumental music, and also many songs. Um, some of his recordings, some of his songs and, and instrumentals were also recorded by the Israel Broadcasting um, Team in Arab, the Arabic Radio Orchestra. So in the next slide, we see a picture of, um, of uh, Salim and Nur as an older man on the left, and uh, Elias Shasha, who played in the orchestra and was also the singer. He's an oud player and singer, and it has really the greatest of musicians here, all iconic names um, from, from Baghdad. Anyway, let's listen to a little bit of this now. <laughs> Thanks. We are really hearing the cream of um, Baghdadi mu musicians here. They represent the last generation who was born in Baghdad and played in Baghdad and then came to Israel um, as well. We really have great names there, Abraham Salman on Hanun, Dawood Akram on violin. Um, really, I should read all of them, but you've been able to see them. Okay, let's move on now. And um, Salim Daoud was another brilliant composer for Salim Pasha for five years from 1939 to 1944. He himself was a composer, a singer, a violinist, and an award. He played the oud. And um, unfortunately, he composed many, many songs for her, but none were recorded. So unfortunately, we do not have any recordings of, of his work. Um, so let's move on now. While both Salima Murad and the Dakaka group may have been invited to play at the same event, for example, an all-night henna party, it is unlikely they would have appeared at the same time or during the same part of the evening. The songs for the henna ceremony itself would have been performed by the Dakaka and her group for about half an hour. And although Salima knew the songs, she would arrive after midnight performing her own repertoire throughout the night. So what about the legacy of these two ladies in the next slide? The majority of Iraqi Jews emigrated to Israel during 50 and 51. All the Jewish musicians emigrated as well, except for the women singers. Salima Murad, Sultana Yusuf, who had gone to Mosul, Nadima Ibrahim. They all remained behind. Salima married the celebrated Iraqi singer Nawam al Ghazali in the late 1950s, converting to Islam. She permitted him to sing her repertoire because normally you would not sing someone else's repertoire. Salima's songs have continued to be sung widely in Iraq and in the Iraqi diaspora and including in Israel. For example, as in the next slide, Najat um, sang until approximately the late 1980s. She had also gone from Baghdad to Israel in the 50s. Najat specialized in Iraqi song, including those of Salima, and she was particularly renowned for her authentic performances of Iraqi song in the new style. One of her last performances was part of a historic concert celebrating the musical traditions of the Jews of Iraq, in which she performed with Saleh al-Kwaiti. Another 
very important singer in the next slide is Iman. Um, now, if you remember Iman, uh, her private name is Suzanne Sharbani, and her father we saw earlier, Abdu Saada, who was a singer from Syria and performed um, in Baghdad as well. Now, Iman has been a professional singer in Israel since the 1970s, and as I said, the daughter of Abdu Saada. Her repertoire includes Salima's songs, Iraqi folkloric material, Egyptian music of the 1930s to 70s, like the music of Abdul Wahab, Um Kulthum, Farid al-Atrash, Asmahan, and their contemporaries. And she also sings songs from her father's repertoire. She did not sing professionally in Baghdad, which she left newly married and still a teenager. Though she no longer performs in public, she's still acknowledged as one of the foremost singers in the Iraqi Jewish community in Israel, as is Najat. Um, I, I am in touch with Iman, I spoke to her just recently, and I believe there's been a long article in Arabic written about her for somewhere in Australia. So that's, so her fame is quite worldwide. Okay, and the next slide. Um, more recently in Israel, Salima's songs have reached a still wider audience. Yair Delal, who is a composer and oud player and violinist and singer, um, his parents are originally from Iraq. Um, he was born in Israel, and he's internationally famous for his performances of Arab music. He also specializes in the music of Iraq. Um, this was from a concert at the Suzanne Delal Center. Now, Yayu Delal organized a program celebrating Salima Murad, as we see in the next slide, um, at the International Oud Festival in Jerusalem. So Salima Murad, the voice of Baghdad, a tribute to the great Iraqi vocalist. Um, Salima's songs, those composed by the El Kwaiti brothers, are further celebrated in a recent album, as you see in the next slide, um, by Dudu Tasa and the Kuwaitis. Uh, it is known as Al Hajar, and it's re released both as a CD and LP. Al Hajar is one of the songs composed by Salah al Kwaiti for Salima Murad. The whole title is Al Hajar Mu'ada Gariba. Desertion is not a strange habit. Dudu Tasa is the grandson of Dawood al Kwaiti, Dawood being Salah al Kwaiti's brother. Dudu Tasa is an Israeli rock star, songwriter, and singer, and honors the output and memories of his grandfather Dawood and of Salah al Kwaiti in his work. We can move on now to the next slide. And in the case of the Dakhaka, even in Baghdad by the 1940s, she was no longer a popular person to invite to, a, to your celebration. And at a henna ceremony, instead of having a Dakhaka, people might instead have gramophone records of the latest foxtrots, foxtrots and they would dance to that. So she was considered pretty outmoded by then. Um, in Israel, as we see in the next slide, um, Lulu Shama, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we can go back to the previous slide. Um, so, no, sorry, the previous one. The other way, sorry. That's it, thank you. Lulu Shama, who we see over here, is a fourth generation Dakaka and she had accompanied her mother and grandmother in Baghdad. She played only occasionally as a Dakaka when she came to Israel. And initially under the influence of the new state, her own children were ashamed of her profession and broke her drums. However, by 1987, the Iraqis felt that they should honor their heritage and she was brought back really from her sick bed in hospital to play at this concert. Um, we can move on now. In 1989 and 1992, I interviewed Signora Halabi. You see her sitting um, third left with a white shawl around her shoulders. She grew up in the Dakaka tradition and she is in fact a cousin of Lulu Shama, who we just saw. Signora is also a fourth generation Dakaka, but she did not perform professionally in Iraq as she left in the early 50s when she was still only 25. It is interesting that she referred to their grandmother, Farha Bitshama, as Isha Kashera Utoba, 
in Hebrew, a kosher and a good woman. And Signora appeared first as a dakhaka in Israel uh, when she was about 32 years of age. So it was seen that Signora rep represents the last hereditary dakhaka, the end of the line. She observed then that she has only one daughter living in the United States and that no one is interested in carrying on this hereditary tradition. They just won't, she said, and no one can play the Nakara any longer. I suppose she means in the style of the Dakaka. At the time of my interview with her in 1989, she was still performing occasionally. So in the next slide, um, this was when I interviewed her. Um, I have to say very briefly, I don't want to take too long, um, it took quite a while to set up this interview. I was in Jerusalem at the time. She was living in Shkunat Tikva, which is uh, near, uh, near Tel Aviv. And um, so I phoned her on a number of occasions to try and set up an, an interview. And she said, well, the thing was that her radadat, her, her accompanists, the singers, were all in Egypt on holiday, and we'd have to wait for her, them to come back. So finally, after a few calls, yes, they were coming back. So we went, I went with my aunt and cousins, about four or five of us went together. And uh, she greeted us at the door of her apartment. And she said, but she's really sorry. She cannot um, interview with me today. She cannot sing because her radadat are still all in Egypt. So frankly, this was a horrible shock. And I thought, there's somehow we've got to do it. So I said, um, what's the problem? She said, no, she's got to have the radadat singing all the responses. So I said, well, maybe some of our family can sing the responses. She said, yes, that's fine. It turned out, however, that none of the women in our family could sing, that only the men could sing. She said, that will not do. I cannot have men singing with me. She said, it's got to be a woman. So things were getting a bit more desperate. And I said, well, how about if the men dress up as women? She said, that would be fine. So honestly, that was fantastic. And she went off, brought her beautiful um, velvet dressing gown that you see here and a scarf and put it on Abudi's uh, head. And off they went with him playing the duff, the tambourine, her playing the nakara and them singing away. In fact, as you see in the next slide, um, not only did Abudi play, but Haron Fatal also accompanied her. And I said, well, was he going to have a dressing gown? She said, no, that was absolutely fine. And I suppose she had one person dressed up as a woman. That was really quite enough. And honestly, they were fantastic. They sang all the responses with her. He played the Dumbuk, the, uh, Abudi played the uh, Duff, and uh, Signora played the Nakara and sang away. And the women in our group put down money every now and then, which is what one does at a Dakaka performance. So, so that was fantastic. Um, so in the next slide now, um, that's her playing the various instruments, the dumbuk and the duff. I believe, uh, I, well, I can't see it. She had a, a cig um, maybe cigarette or an ashtray there as well. Anyway, that was an interview to remember. However, this hereditary profession really has died out completely. Nevertheless, the repertoire persists and continues to be enjoyed at henna celebrations. For example, in the next slide, we see here a henna evening for Galit and Ido. Galit is the daughter of Iman, who I mentioned is the singer, and Iman is the daughter of Abu Saada. So this is a henna celebration in Ramat Tasharon in 1997. Here we see not a dakaka, but a man, Nasim Rabia, singing to the couple. You can see the um, couple sitting at the table uh, with the tall candles and probably by now they've had the henna put on. And that's the picture on the left. And the picture on the right, Nassim, Nassim Rabia is singing, I'm sure it's Afaki, because it's the way he's got his hand held out and he's looking straight at Iman, who you might notice on the left hand side of that picture, she has the kind of print dress on and she's got her arms up in horror and no doubt he's saying afaki afaki oh bravo to you on the tricks you've played you've taken my son ready made you've you know um just bewitched him and taken him away um and here as well you see an oud player just maybe the back of him you can notice and there was a violinist so they, these were all male performers singing um singing the traditional songs in judeo arabic of the dakaka um, so we can move on now, getting 
to the end. Um, so Salima and the Dakaka group, their repertoire is still highly valued with new performers carrying on their legacy to new audiences. The audiences are mainly of Iraqi heritage, whether they're in Iraq or in the Iraqi diaspora, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. And the songs for the life cycle celebrations um, are sung for henna evenings or as pure entertainment, as Afaki is sung, as pure entertainment at the end of a maqam. In the case of Salima, her performances have touched an even wider audience with the availability online of audio and video files affording the possibility of enjoying her original performances, which are still so valued and cherished. And now we have remodernized performances of Saleh and Daoud Il Kweti's modern comp compositions, now given the rock star treatment by the younger generation. So Salima's songs have certainly been projected into a new dimension with an even wider audience but both traditions are still highly valued. Thank you very much. And um, before we have questions, which I'm happy to try to answer, I would like to wish anyone who is celebrating the Jewish New Year shortly, a very happy and healthy New Year, and to say, may you merit many years. Thank you. Um, Lynn, I don't hear you because you're muted. Um, right. Thank you, everyone. Um, right. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was wonderful. Sorry, that was a terrible echo. Uh, no, that was absolutely wonderful because you managed to weave in not only the story of these two ladies, but um, the, the story of, of really the Jewish contribution to Iraqi uh, musical culture. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, I, I'm sure that people have questions. Uh, I don't know if you want to look in the chat uh, there, Sarah, and see if there's anything there uh, that you'd like to answer. Um, okay, I'm just Oops. looking for a question so far, but um, thank, you. thank you to everyone. Um, no, she's not muted. No, not muted at my end. Yeah. Sorry, Sarah, I can't hear you. No, oh, um, you. it's probably because I'm not talking. Um, can you can you hear me now? Has your microphone <laughs> become unplugged? No. Um, can you? No. Hello. Hello? It says it's it says that I'm muted by the host. Oh, yeah. It's um the, the pro Sarah, the problem is at your end. No. Can't hear you. Oh yeah. I can hear. Look, it's only us. Only us. Thanks. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Oh sorry. sorry that was at our <laughs> end. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um Right, so I'm sorry. Thank you all for all these lovely comments, but I don't think I've seen any questions so far. So um, if anyone has a question, I'm happy to. One about uh, Kol Isha. Are the Ashkenazim hung up about uh, hearing a woman's voice and perhaps the, um, the Iraqi Jews are less hung up about this? I suppose it's all historical. I would say in the past, um, and maybe even among some Iraqi Jews today, we could be equally hung up about it. I mean, Koli Shah is the, the, the problem about hearing a woman's voice. Well, it is problematic. And I presume with the Dakaka, she was initially allowed to sing and even the rabbinate allowed her to sing because she only sang to women. Mm -hmm. And she was not a diva in that sense. She was not a young woman. She was past childbearing age, she was a mature woman, she sang only to women, so that was quite acceptable. And presumably that's why initially, um, someone like Salima, um, though she was revered and recorded, some people would 
say they would have nothing to do with her, that, you know, that she, she was not respectable. So I think musicians would say, yes, she was respectable, but there definitely is that problem. So I would say even today, and well, I mean, you mentioned originally earlier on that I have my group Rivers of Babylon in which I sing and Pamela Solomon sings and we have women singers. And that is a problem um, if we are invited by say a synagogue to perform, we can't sing, the women will not sing. So I think um, uh, while some Ashkenazim may have this problem in the synagogue, I presume that some of Ashkenazim and Sephardim and anyone would, might go to a general concert and hear women sing. So I think it depends on the context. Um, it still is an issue, yeah. We've got some que a, a, a question from Facebook from Lily Shaw at the uh, Or Yehuda. Did Masuda come to Israel? Masuda al-Bambayli, I don't have her dates exactly. I believe she did not come to Israel. I believe she died in Baghdad and then one of her sons moved to Bombay after that. Um, she didn't come to Israel, but a lot of her family and this, they are a really a very musical family. Um, not only herself and her nephew, Yaakov Elimari, but also other members of their family in Israel are famous musicians. Uh, but I don't believe she came to Israel, no. And on Facebook, Daniel Jonas, Carol Isaac and Gil Carpes all send their, their thanks for a lovely meeting. <laughs> oh, thank you. And please uh, reciprocate uh, my best wishes to everyone. Thank you. Uh, I think somebody's asked, um, where can one find the recordings? I don't know if you answered that one. The complete Well, some recordings of Salima are, um, are on on YouTube, on Emil uh, Cohen's El Kweti event uh, website. So you will get a lot of Salima. Um, the Dakaka recordings I had from a double LP issued many, many years ago by the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Center. So the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Center in Israel at Or Yehuda might be able to um, put people onto, uh, they might still have those recordings or know where to get them from. Yeah. Sorry. If you want to ask questions, can you ask them in the chat function rather than raise your hand? Yeah, okay. Uh, and of course, now, now that um, Iraq is being much more honest about who composed these, these, uh, these songs, you know, that these were Jewish composers, they're not just traditional tunes. Yes. Yeah. Folklore. Presumably, um, you could probably get these, these recordings uh, from Iraqi sources. Um, yes, as I say, Salima's recordings will be generally easily available, um, but the Dakaka, I don't think, are going to be easily available. Um, but again, the song Afaki has been performed by so many Maqam singers, so that will be available of Maqam singers' recordings. Um, but yes, they certainly are all highly valued and accepted today. Um, I mean, in one sense, it, it's quite good that all this material is in a folkloric connect collection, even though it, at the time, didn't say who actually composed them. But they were obviously considered to be the folklore of Iraq, which is also very important. Yes. I think Emile's got a question about Shama the Dakaka. Um, about Lulu Shama? Yes, but he hasn't said what, what he wanted to ask. And also someone, Ahmed <laughs> Rahman, yes. who also said he's got a question. Let's see how long um, he yes. refers to join. Yes, um, sort of, yes, so Emil, I don't know what your question is about Shama. There was, um, there was Farha Bit Shama who performed the 1920s, who uh, a lot of my informants remembered as being very good. And then she was, it, her daughter and granddaughter, etc., then performed. So Farhabit Shama's granddaughters were both Lulu Shama, who we saw the very elderly Dakaka, whose children had broken her sticks or her drums when she came to Israel. That was one of Farhabit Shama's uh, granddaughters. And the other granddaughter was Signora El Halabi, who I um, interviewed, and you saw pictures of her singing with uh, the two male um, accompanists, who were, one of whom was dressed up. But I'm not sure what exactly what other question. Right. Ahmed Rahman first wants to ask a question and then Emil. Okay. Ahmed, go ahead. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. This is a very Hello. informative Hello. session. I oh. uh, enjoy it very much. What Thank I you. want to uh, just to add, uh, just a little comment. Uh, there was uh, a series on the Iraqi TV. It has been, uh, I think, uh, been produced in 2012. Uh -huh. uh, it is about, I think, 16 series about uh, Salima Murad and, okay. and all this uh, her repertoire. It has been performed with, uh, uh, anyway, almost gives the same uh, setting of the time and, and, uh, and costume and everything. So people who ask about her uh, repertoire or if they could follow this uh, uh, TV series in Arabic, I could send uh, later this uh, link for, this is, this, I think it's about 16 episodes. That's fantastic, Ahmed. Yes, I, I mean, I would be very happy to have the link and if anyone else wants them, yeah. we can share that. Um, right. I, I do have a problem because I don't, I mean, I read Arabic with great difficulty, but I don't write it that easily or to put it onto YouTube. And very often, it's only if you actually write, write the words in Arabic that you then get up so much more information than if you try yeah. and write it in English. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Ahmed. I'd be really happy. No problem. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Emil now. Yes, it's really about, uh, I get a response from Rachel Akhlasi on the very question that I Sorry, Emil, I, sorry, I don't hear what you're saying. About uh, Lulu Shama. I appeared that much. My, my uh, Passed away a few days after that. And yes. This is confirmed by Rachel. This is true. 1987. Right. Yes, it was difficult to hear what you said, Emil. It was actually very musical. But I think what we got was that, uh, yes, Lulu Shama did pass away very soon after that concert. In fact, she was very ill when she came, but she didn't want to miss the concert for anything. And they gave her a lot of medication to, to actually bring her there. Um, so that was her swan song. And it's, it's wonderful that she was able to come there. Thank you, yes. Anyone else want to raise any questions? Oh, I want to say something. Yes. Because I've just seen David Menashe here. Hi, David. Um, we, I mentioned that I was so pleased to find out who Masoud al Bambayli was because her nephew, Simon Menashe, happened to speak to me. Well, Simon's brother, Maya Menashe, Shalom. He, so Maya's son, David, is here. So not only have we heard about Masouda's nephew, Simon, but now we have Masouda's great nephew, David Menashe, here with us today. And, um, and David's grandfather, uh, Imneshi, in, in Bombay, was a wonderful singer and a teacher of Hebrew and sang all Arabic songs in Judeo-Arabic or regular Arabic. Sorry to have just brought that in, but I just yeah, saw you do. Fantastic, and very glad that, yeah. that he's here. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. When I mentioned to my mother, who's 94, that we were going to do this, mm -hmm. uh, this, this program on, on uh, Dakakat, um, she, she got all excited and she said, oh, she remembers the Dakaka coming to the house and, and her mother got really excited because the Dakaka was announcing, um, you know, a, a forthcoming celebration and inviting the people in the house to it. Was that very common? Um, you know, that she would be like a town crier announcing a, a, a celebration and, you know. That, that's very interesting. Um, I'm not, I can't say I know exactly of that, but I'm sure that would have happened. What yeah. I heard was that um, the minute a Dakaka heard that there was going to be a henna ceremony, she would go to, because there was more than one Dakaka, she would go to the house and put her sticks at the entrance so that she reserved her place. So that if the host didn't actually invite a dakaka, they invited themselves and put the sticks there and were, were ready to play. So, um, yeah. No, but I didn't know that. So please thank your mother. That's uh, fantastic. 
it was her contribution. So if, if there are no more questions, um, I think we will wrap up uh, there. I, I would like to thank you so much, Sarah, for the most informative talk. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, next week, we go to Iran from Iraq, uh, something completely different. I'd like to wish you all Shana uh, Tova, Tiskule Shanim Rabot, and keep safe, keep well, and see you next time. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you all. It was great to see you all. Everyone's unmuted if they want to say anything. And Sarah, I apologize. There's a short time lag between me doing the mic and actually changing slides. And it, I was actually doing what you were saying, but not one or two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> you were fantastic, Lawrence. So both as DJ and Thank in the very much. To all. Oh, yes. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. So nice to see you. Thank you. And Thank you. some of the others. I enjoyed it very much. It brought back some memories from when I was a little girl. <laughs> in Bombay with, you, us, with us all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. It's cool as an imminent book. Thank you. Thank you all, really. Thank you. Good, good. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, we got to sign off. Where do you sign off? Leave the meeting. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's like the farmers in the dell. One by one. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Lynn, as well. Yes. It's wonderful to have it today, especially because New Year's around the corner. And also today for us, uh, the um, friendship between Israel and Bahrain. Oh, yes. Celebrating. Oh, I'm, we are celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling you had something to do with this, Olivia. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I worked behind the scenes. I thought you might. Wow. Hitra old. Hitra old. Hitra old. Hitra old. Okay. Hitra old. Still leaving the still leaving meeting. Still leaving meeting. Yeah, doesn't want to go. <laughs> To go. <laughs> Hanging in there. Thank you. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll end the meeting, I think, now. That yes. would be the best, yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Enjoy Thank that you. so much. Shanatova. Shanatova. Okay, what is this leading meeting?